good, but I want good. He said, if, he said, if I just took my time to complain, I, I can find a reason why I should. Oh, thank you. Oh, I could complain, but I won't. I thought about it, but I choose not to. All I want to do is lift my hands and say, Lord, I thank you. Thank you, Lord, because at the end of the day, whether you've done what I've asked you to do or not, you've been good to me. And I just want to raise my hand and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For another chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could complain, but I won't. I thought about complaining, but I didn't. Oh, Lord. But one thing I will do, I just say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It ought to be a release for somebody this morning. Just to look toward heaven. Raise your hand oh, and say thank you, Lord. Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. He's here. He's here. I could, but I won't. Thank you. I thought about it, but I didn't. Thank you. So I know you've been good to me. Ah, thank you, Lord. And therefore, I just say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just in case you worked here this morning and you didn't have the chance to praise him, this is a good opportunity right now just to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Oh, Lord. Thank, thank you for how good you've been. You've been thank so you, Lord, good. for keeping us. Lord, I'm in my right mind. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I'm able to walk on my own. Lord, I just want to say thank you. Lord, I got food on my table. Lord, I just want to say thank you. I got cans in the cupboard. Lord, I just want to say thank you. Lord, you've been good to me. Yes. And I've just stopped by to tell you, Lord, I thank you. Thank you. For one Lord, more chance. Lord, Lord thank I thank you. you for blessing us and strengthening us. Ah, Lord, I thank you. There's no God like our God. He is God all by himself. No one created him as God. No one elected him to be God. No one voted in me in to be God. He just always is God. He is God all by himself. And we just come by to say, Lord, I thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us and wrapping your arms around us. I'm telling you, we serve the awesome and the amazing God. He is God. He is God. And we come to this place to worship our almighty God. We've come to to worship him. We've come to worship the God that we serve. He is the amazing God. He is the amazing God. Call your attention to 1 Samuel chapter 17 in the Old Testament. The book is 1 Samuel. Chapter 17, 1 Samuel chapter 17, in the Old Testament, the book is 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 17, 1 Samuel chapter 17. You see a blank on the board because I wrestle with it. Somebody says, it's not there. Usually he gives us a head start down the road. He, he usually tells us where we're going because I, I wrestled, I wrestled. Have you ever wrestled with it? Well, this is the beginning of the year, and I'm trying to make sure that we are on target with vision and mission and on target with what we have to do for the Lord, so I wrestled, wrestled with it. First Samuel chapter 17. <coughs> In the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning at verse number 48, ending at verse number 51. 
1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 48 through 51. You found it, you would discover these words. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Yes, sir. Then David put his hand in his bag yes, and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead. Right. So that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that there was a champ, their champion was dead, they fled. I want to talk about unusual victories. Right, right. Unusual victories. During this year, and I've said it several times, we have set forth our New Year's resolutions. Some women have decided to treat their husbands right. <coughs> Some men have decided to make sure that she knows she's the queen of the house. New Year's resolution, some brothers have decided that they're going to be cordial toward each other. During this new year, some sisters have decided to stop their shenanigans against each other. Some others have put aside watching over their children so closely and said, go on, I'm going to let God handle you at this point. New Year's resolutions all around us, some children have decided, I am going to get my lesson for the rest of the year. Right. Some people have decided in their lives that I didn't do too good when I started, but I'm going to finish this thing well. New Year's resolutions all around us, and the fact of the matter is, you ought to have a New Year's resolution. But it ought to last past Resurrection Sunday morning. We have to come to a conclusion that we want victory out of this life. We have to come to the conclusion that we don't want to live poor, busted, and disgusted any longer. We have to come to the conclusion that pardon won't be the only thing I will do in 2024. I'm not only going to do my dance in the end, not only am I going to do my dance on the dance floor in the club, we have to come to the conclusion that we're going to do our dance when we think about the goodness of God. <coughs> songwriter says, God has been good to me. The songwriter declares that I could complain, but I won't complain. As we move into a new year, we ought to set goals that we can stick to. Now, when we set goals, we ought to expect some unusual blessings. We ought to expect some unusual victories. Somebody's goal ought to be to pay my house off this year. 
Somebody go ought to be able to save two, three dollars more in the bank this year. Somebody's goal ought to be to inspect my household and make sure that I am leading my family in the righteous way before the Lord. We ought to come to the conclusion every now and then that as for me and my house, we're going to put God first. I know you ought to be able to go to God and say, God, I know I haven't done things right in the past. You ought to go to God and say, God, I know I missed the mark and I have not done all I could do for my children. But God, I'm going to do better this year. And as you set your New Year's resolution, don't come to the conclusion that you're just going to do good and do better this year, but you're going to make a lifestyle of doing what is right. Somebody has gotten to a point where I am really going to eat healthy, I'm going to live healthy, I am going to exercise daily, and these things we ought to do. Let me serve notice on you. Everybody is not going to be a Coca-Cola bottle. I, I, Brother Miles, I think I said that again. I said everybody is not going to be a Coca-Cola bottle. Some of us going to end up looking like a can. But you ought to be healthy. Regardless of the shape you have, you ought to be healthy. You ought to come to the conclusion, God, I realize that this is my temple, and I know that you reside in my temple, and because you reside in my temple, Lord, I'm going to take care of my temple. I'm going to think the right things. I'm going to act the right way, and, and I'm not going to be so boisterous when I talk. I'm not going to stream to the top of my lungs. I'm, I'm just going to confront people and have adult conversations. Come to the conclusion that I'm going to like my teacher regardless of what my teacher tells me to do. And I'm going to do my assignments and it's going to be on time. Somebody have come to the conclusion that if I am going to be victorious in this life, I'm going to have to study the word of God. Because it's the word of God that changes hearts and changes minds. It's the word of God that make us strong. What would it have been like on May 24th, 2022 at Robb Elementary School if just two police officers had decided to push the door open and save the lives of 21 people, 19 children, and two teachers. What would it have been like had those who pledged their lives to serve and protect, who wears a badge, who has a taser, who has a gun that are big and bad on the streets when they stop you? What would it have been like if just one, maybe two of the people who are armed and dangerous every day had they confronted a armed gunman, gunman in a school, would we be counting 19 children? Would we be counting two teachers? If they would have had the galls in the guts to do their jobs, because we expect them to run toward danger and not run from danger. When you see officers standing in the, in the, in the hallway putting hand sanitizer on their hand when children are calling 911 and you see them going toward the door and then running back from the door. What cowards? Only two pieces of sheep rock. Only two by fours. And only a open door separating them from saving lives. 
God could have performed unusual victories had they just done the job that they pledged to do. How much more can God use you if you just let God have his way? We look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. The Israelites are faced with the Philistine army. And the Philistine army had sent out their nine-foot-tall giant called Goliath. He was taunting them. He was talking about their God. He was the champion for the Philistines. He had a spear. He had a sword. Nine feet tall. He was belittling the Israelites in their army. People were depending on this Israelite army to take down the entire Philistine nation, but they stood and did nothing. The Bible says that he came out every day and he taunted them and insulted them. And he insulted their God. Daddy sends David out to give his brothers some food, and, and David want to know, who is this bully that's rattling off at the mouth? Who is this guy that you all sitting back and you all listening to him, and, and he is here to stop your goal from being accomplished? You have any goals that you have something between you and your goal, and, and God is telling you all you got to do is move? All you have to do is participate. All you have to do is change your heart and change your mind. But you're sitting still doing nothing. I called somebody the other day. I said, hey, what you doing? Nothing. I said, can you explain to me how I can get to the point in my life where I can sit and do nothing? I don't believe even the retired retired to do nothing. How, I ask the question, what goes on in your mind when you're sitting and doing nothing? Do you think about good things? Do you think about bad things? When your mind is not thinking about those things that are good, you are losing your mind. Lou Ross says it like this. He says that a mind is a terrible thing to waste. I'm still trying to figure out if some of you from the audience can tell me today, how can you live 24 hours a day and do nothing, say nothing, go nowhere, and expect your goal to be met? Young people, we have goals to reach. This year, somebody decided that they're going to write a book, but they hadn't started. Somebody decided, I'm going to save money, but they haven't started. Somebody decided, I'm going to buy me another car, but they haven't started. Somebody decided, I'm going to get off Metro bus, and I'm going to get me a bike and start riding, but they hadn't started. Somebody decided that I'm, I'm going to make a move, and, and when I make this move, I, it's going to be a move that everybody knows that God did it. Let me tell you, but if you got to post it on Facebook, if you got to put it on X, then God can't get the glory. In the text, you find these guys sitting, doing nothing. In a text of class, they were eating. Can you imagine the whole nation is depending on us? And we as the church are sitting and we are eating and we are doing nothing. This world is on fire. This world is on its way to hell in a handbasket. This world is calling for men, women, boys, and girls in the Christian faith to make a move, and we can't make a move later. We got to make a move right now. I know, I know when I was growing up, I, I was telling Daddy, you know, Daddy, the weeks are going out to this place. He said, well, I ain't the weeks, Daddy. 
I said, but daddy, uh, everybody else is doing it. Uh, but yeah, but you are not everybody else. Young people have to understand that we have to have goals and it takes sacrifice to reach those goals. In the text, in the text we find, we find the king says, the king says that whoever takes out Goliath, I'm going to do some things on your behalf. He says, he says, if you take out Goliath, I'm going to bless you real good, a heap and a plenty. In verse number 26 and 27, we got to realize, first of all, we must trust God to give us the victory. We got to trust God. We got to trust God to give us the victory. We can't trust anybody else. We've been singing this song, and I've been singing this song with you. Uh, C.J. Strauss is the best thing since a long time, but we can't depend on him, Sister Brown, to give us the victory. Even C.J. Stroud says that he's depending on the almighty God himself. When we look at the text, we look at the text, David shows up and David spoke to the men. And when he spoke to the men, David urges them to kill him. David asks the question, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? The one who defies the army of the almighty God. And the people answered him with one manner saying, so shall it be done for the man who kills him will be rewarded. Let me tell you, let me tell you, you have to trust God to give you the victory because you can't depend on men. You, you got to trust God. You got to trust God to give you the victory because men will always, people will always make you doubt God in your life. That, my second point is people will always, people will always make you doubt what God is doing in your life. People will always say you can't take him. People will always say you can't do it. Why are you listening to people who are going nowhere, who are doing no things, who has no goals, who has no purpose, but they're always trying to pull you down? You know, you know anybody? You know anybody that, that once you got off the bus ride and got your own car, they said, ooh, everybody ain't able. Have you ever seen anybody, once you got a dime over a dollar, they begin to say, oh, girl, you balling and shot calling. They are not complimenting you. They are not supporting you. They are not doing what you thought they would do and reward you. What they are trying to do is tear you down. People will always tear you down. So you got to remove. My, my next point is you need to remove yourself from negativity. When we look at the text, the text declares that David shows up, his brother get on him and say, what are you doing here? I know you just want to look at the battle unfold. David made the observation and David said, well, you ain't doing nothing. You just stand around. It's always the people who are never doing anything, who are never headed anywhere that will always pull you down. You, you need to understand that people will always doubt what God is doing in your life. My next point is found in verse number 28. You need to remember that you need to keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. You need to make sure that regardless of what they say, regardless of what they've done, keep hope alive. David asked the question, in verses 28 and 29, David asked the question, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Is there not a reason for us to take this dude and take him down? Is there not a cause? It's like a man. It's like a man that hear noise outside the house and he kicks his, woman, his wife and says, go check, it, check on it and see what's going on. She, 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 she's fast asleep. He wakes her up. He says, shake her. He shakes her and he has the audacity and says, baby, baby, something going on outside. Baby, will you, will you get up and, and, go, and go outside? Will you go check the doors? Will you check around the house? That's what the, the Israelite army was doing. They were sitting there waiting on somebody to move. It reminds me of church folk. 
when it's time to work for the Lord, we are sitting and we're waiting on somebody else to do it. Don't walk across paper when you can pick it up. Don't, don't say it's somebody else's responsibility. Don't say somebody ought to do it. You do it because it does not matter who is assigned to the job. You want to make sure that your campus is a five-star campus. You want to make sure if, if some sand blasting, water blasting need to be done, you bother to pass it, I'll help you get it, do it done, and I, I'll recruit somebody else to help me. Don't sit soaking sour. Make sure you keep hope. Alive. My next point is that you need to have confidence in how God will give you favor. You need to have confidence. You need to be confident in how God will give you favor. Verse number 28 talks about the fact that, that David goes and, and he tells them how God is blessing. And I know you're proud. And this is, this is what his brother said. I know you're proud. I know your heart. And I know you just want to look at the battle. Verse number 29, David asked the question, is there not a cause? David is showing forth confidence, not only in himself, but in his God. Let me tell you, you got to have confidence in your God. You have to have confidence that your God will deliver, and you got to stand and act like you've got confidence in God. I tell, I, tell, I tell young people, you going for an interview, when you're going for an interview, you need to dress up, you need to trim your hair, you need to put on your tie, you need to make sure that you show up on your best, you need to get plenty of rest, you need to make sure you got plenty of sleep the night before, and you need to speak well, practice it in the mirror, you need to be on the scene, and you need to be prepared for whatever question is asked, because you have researched, you've looked at the company, you know what they're doing. I'm telling you, I got laid off in 1996. I was walking downtown Houston trying to find a job. I had a suit and a tie on. I was looking the part. When I walked in, in the human resource office, I, I looked like I had it going on. I didn't have but 32 cents in my pocket. 600 miles from home. No family, anyone, anywhere around. 32 cents in my pocket, but I had a clean suit on, I had a necktie on, I had a white shirt on, and I was prepared. My shoulders were squared back. My head was up because I had confidence in the God that I served that he would deliver. I just had to make sure I played my part. That's my next point. My next point is you need to pay your part. You need to play your part. You need to participate in the blessing. You need to play, play your part, participate. God loves participation. Don't just sit and watch folk do it and say, oh, we, that's awesome. Oh, that's amazing. No one can do it like you can do it. This is something that's, that's truly amazing to me. Don't act like everybody else can do it other than you. Don't act like that others can accomplish goals that you cannot accomplish. God is doing something in you right now today. God is wanting to use you right now today. God has made you because he wants the best for you and he wants the best through you. Just because you've gone through some things doesn't matter that you can't make it. I mean, life can be torn up for you. Life can be jacked down for you. Life can be messed up from the floor up for you, but God wants to use you. There ought to be some testimonies in here today that will testify that I was at my last and I was at the rock bottom, but God picked me up. God turned me around. God put my feet on solid ground. God did it, and he did it for me. My next point is, recall the victories of your past. Recall, remember what God has done in your life. You ought to tell the devil, devil, I've been here before. I may not have, have faced this same situation. I may not have been faced this same circumstance, but I've been here before. And I have, I've been with my back against the wall before. But God pulled me out. Look what David says in verses 34 and 36. David tells the story of how a lion attacked. 
he tells the story how, how there was a bear that attacked. And when this lion and bear attacked my, my daddy's sheep, then I killed them. Don't, don't get so grandil only that you have to have these great testimonies and make up lies. Don't, don't, don't sit and try to match every testimony that everybody else has. Just recall how God has blessed you in the past. And the same God who has blessed you in the past is able to bless you in the present. That's why the late Pastor Paul Jones says, I won't complain because the Lord's been good to me. Everybody in this room knows how good God is. God has blessed you, and he's blessed you in spite of you. In spite of your meanness, in, in spite of your condition, in spite of what you didn't have, our God has blessed us. It's a sad day when we find some things to complain about God. It's, it's a sad day when we look more at what God didn't do and can't see what God has already done. Recall the victories of your past. My next point to you is found in verse 37. Express your belief in God. You got to express it. Don't be ashamed of it. God has a way of opening doors in the middle of conversation. You may not be able to stand on the table and testify at your job, and you ought not do that because you need a job the next day. You ought not interfere with folk as they work to talk about the Lord. But one of these old days, while you're building yourself up in the word of God, one of these days when you're studying the word of God, one of these days when, when you are meditating on the word of God, somebody's going to walk up to you and they're going to ask the question and God just, whew, just threw the door wide open. I oftentimes say, if, if you don't want my fruit, don't shake my tree. And if you sense, and sense, and if you shake my tree, I'm going to give you my fruit. I had, I had an opportunity to go in and, and have, a, have an evaluation from one of my bosses. I had an evaluation. I already knew the evaluation was bad. They'd already told me, Matt, they, they're going to ring you out when you get in there. And my statement always is, let's see what the Lord says about it. I went in there and I was prepared to hear what he had to say. But even in your worst situation, you need to look to see how God's going to use you in that situation. I walked in. He started talking to me about you didn't do this. You did do this. You did do this. You didn't do this. And before he could finish, he broke down in tears. He said, this is the day. Ten years ago that I lost my boy. Boy, God threw the door wide open. In the midst of my evaluation, in the midst of my evaluation, in the midst of evaluation that I got, got scheduled to go in and get an F in, in the midst of it, a counseling session took place. God threw the door open. No one was there but him and, and me. And when I began to tell him about the goodness of God, I began to see him move some numbers around on the paper. He said, well, you did do this last time, so I'm going to give you credit for it this time. It's because I was not ashamed to talk about my God in the midst of his situation. Matter of fact, I had already come to the conclusion, if he's going to write me up, I'm going to get written up anyway. I, I might as well talk Talk about the goodness of God. If he going to tell me don't come back anymore, he going to tell me not to come back anymore anyway. On my way out the door, I need to tell them about the goodness of God. God threw the door open. He said it was 10 years ago I lost my boy. That boy was the closest thing to me. And I said to him, well, God is trying to turn your heart toward him. God wants you to stop thinking about the, the terrible things that happened to your boy, the death of your boy. Don't let this anniversary of your boy's death always creep up on you and make you think that things are bad. God is trying to use you right now. And I watched God use him as he began to move things around. And as he began, and I walked out of there with a real good grade, with a promotion with over 10% increase. It's because you got to be willing to talk about God when God opens the door for you. You have to be willing to express your belief when God opens the door. And God is waiting to open the door for you. You need to walk in the door. 
don't let others decide your need for you. Look at, look at verse number 39. Verse number 39 declares that the king says, now, David, if you're going to go and fight Goliath, take my arm. The king says, David, if you're going to really go and fight Goliath, and, and, you know, everybody else scared anyway. I mean, you got a whole army. The, the, the report says at Robb Elementary, some 77 or more police officers showed up at Robb Elementary School. Some showed up in a matter of three minutes. And they standing in the hallway ducking. Man didn't shoot not, not one single bullet at them. And they running and duckling. What if they had been bold enough? What if they had been men enough? What if they had been women enough to exert their training and make a difference? We wouldn't have been talking about 19 and 2. May have not even been talking about 10. But because they rather pull children out the window than face an armed gunman. Now, these are folk that are trained. You can tell they're trained. When they pull you over, they act like they're trained. When they pull you over, you can have a busted tail light. Well, I have probable cause. May I have your. And if you refuse to give them your license, they jerk you out the car, they tase you, they push you on the ground, then they, they may even shoot you because they're big, bold, and bad. Where was that bigness? Where was that badness when we needed them the most? Now the state of Texas has become a mockery to the whole world. With 77 people that are trained, that have heavy equipment, that are called themselves squat, <laughs> that didn't do squat. We have to understand that you can't allow other people to decide what you need. Don't let other people decide whether you want this armor or that armor. Let me tell you, we, 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 we fight against a real enemy. And the Bible says in, in Ephesians chapter 6, the apostle Paul declares that there's a war going on. And this war is in heavenly places. This war is past us. This war is tearing us asunder. There's a war going on, and we can't see the enemy, but he's real. He's, he's taking our children by storm. He's taking our marriages by storm. He's taking our households by, by storm. He's taking our schools by storm. When we choose to be our children's friend, then be our children's parents the devil has snuck in and he snuck in unaware the bible said you ought to pray the bible said you ought to meditate the bible said your word needs to be plastered on your children's heart on their mind put it on the doorpost put it on their forehead because they need what god has said they need and they need it right now we ought to be we ought to be praying for our unborn children. We, we ought to be praying for unborn husbands and unborn wives. We, we ought to be praying for superintendents that will acknowledge God. We ought to be praying, Lord, we ought to be praying for a governor that will acknowledge God. We ought to be praying for somebody in the Congress to come to some kind of conclusion that acknowledges God. If we're going to make it, if we're going to have an unusual victory, we need to pray. My next point to you is found in verse number 46. God will bless you in your going. God will bless you. God will bless you in your going. In the midst of going forth, the Bible says that when, when Goliath showed up, David ran toward him and didn't run from him. David, the Bible says that David ran toward him. It was unlike Rob's elementary where men and women running back the other way while children are on the phone with 911 saying they're shooting my classmates. When children are having to make split-second decisions that they are not able to make, then you got full-grown people that's not making good decisions. God will bless you as you are going. Verse number 45 and 46, it says that you come with sword, you come with spear, you come with javelin. 
but I come in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. Sometimes we just have to take it personally. You got to take something, something personally because this is your God. Verse 46 says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you and into my hands when I strike you, we will take your head from you. You got to have so much confidence that you don't let anything take your dream. Verse 48, don't let what you see kill your dream. He, 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 has, he has spear, he has javelin, he has sword. Don't let what you see, and he's nine feet tall. Don't let what you see steal your dream. Let my brothers and sisters tell it that, that I always stayed in trouble. Because I was always the smallest one. I'm about 50 pounds bigger right now. But I decided at an early age, I'm not going to be pushed around. I, I decided at an early age that, that I sit up all night long to 2 o'clock in the morning to decide how I can make the tree fall. I mean, I would, I would, go, I would go without sleep, Brother Irvin. I would, I would go without sleep to make sure I don't, win the fight, don't, don't lose the fight. I had to compensate for my size because I knew I wasn't stronger, but I knew I was faster. And I knew, I knew that I couldn't come home after I had lost a fight. Brother Alfred, I'm telling you, Daddy wouldn't allow the boys in the house. He, I mean, you did what? But Daddy, he looks worse than I do. <laughs> he, don't let what you see Destroy your dreams. We got dreams. Don't let your empty pockets, your empty bank account destroy your dreams. You got to set forth a budget. This is a new year. Set forth a budget and stick to it. Don't spend your money on 20, don't spend your money on $2,000 purses if you got $2,200 in the bank. Now, if you have it, do what you want to do. It's your thing. Don't spend the Lord's money and don't spend your money because I've discovered something, Brother Shepherd. I've discovered something. I've discovered that people buy what they want and they beg for what they need. They buy. They buy what they want and they beg for what they need because you are not going to turn them down from what they need. You need to take inventory. What did you do with your money? This is your second time coming to me. What? Let's, let's sit down and do a budget. <laughs> some families are distraught with each other and been that way for 20 years because somebody borrowed $500 and didn't want to pay it back. And this is how, folk, this is how hope folk act. Hey, man, what you coming to me for? They are always guilty. Now, you have, you have forgotten the $500. You moved over. You moved on. But every time they see you, they think you're coming to ask them about it. I shouldn't have to ask you for what I let you borrow. You ought to be man and woman enough to just say, here it is. And if I can't give it all at one time, here's $50 a month for, five, for, for at least five months, ten months. I, I, here it is. Don't let other folk crash your dream. Don't let other folk dream become your dream. There are people who have dreams for you. There are people who can tell you the best thing to do for you. One day, the new pastor came to town. He, he began to preach. And when he got through preaching, he came out the pulpit. Lady walks up to him and said, look, pastor, I got a word for you. The Lord told me to tell you this. He was respectful. He's a brand new pastor. You know, he's respectful. He comes out the pulpit next Sunday. Look, pastor, I got a word from you. The Lord told me to tell you this. By the third time, the pastor has gotten really perturbed with her. So he comes out the pulpit, and she said, wait, pastor, I got a word for you. The Lord told me. He said, look, this is my phone number. Tell God to call me directly. Everybody has a word from the Lord for you. I want to tell you, COVID-19, the devil, and God are the most lied-on entities in this world. 
God told me to do it. God said to do it. The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it, made me say it, and then COVID shut me down. I mean, it's, <laughs> these are the three most lied on entities. Uh, my next point is prepare yourself for the victory. The Bible says, verse number 49, the Bible says that David humbled himself before the Lord, that David veiled over, he, he, David, David prevailed over the Philistine with a slingshot and a stone. You need to prepare yourself. If you're going to college, you need to prepare yourself from college. If, you, if you're going to college, your mind ought to be set that I'm going, I'm going, to, I'm going to have all this free time. Hazen's going to have all this free time. And grandmama ain't going to be there. Mama and granddad ain't going to be there. And I got all this free time. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to set myself up for victory. I'm going to make folk proud of me because this time that I have won't be my free time. I'm going to spend time preparing myself for the next day, the next class, and the next class. Use what God has given you. Verse number 49. Use what God has given you. He gave him a slingshot and stones. Use it. I'm talking about an unusual victory. God wants to give you a victory that other folk can't see. God want to want to do some things in your life that he's not doing in your friend's life. He wants to do something with you even if you're in a household that has never accomplished anything. God wants to do something with you that is different. Verse number 50. Claim the victory. Don't apologize for it. Claim the victory. Verse number 50, verse number 50. You need to claim the victory. So, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a slingshot and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. He claimed the victory without a sword in his hand. But look at verse number 51, and I'll leave you alone. Only God gives unusual victories. Only God. God is the only one. Stop getting involved in all these get-rich-quick schemes. Only God gives unusual victories. Paul says it like this. If a man doesn't work, now let me make sure I line this out right, sisters. If a man doesn't work... He ought to starve to death. I mean, he ought not eat. <laughs> it, it's talking about if he refuses to work. It, it's talking about if he won't do anything. It's talking about the brother that's still sitting trying to rap it, <laughs> write his first rap record. I mean, I can do that. <clears throat> I can do that. But it pays to not make sense. Big C, it, it pays to not to not not even put together a two line sentence, but it's going to run out. Somebody's going to get killed. Get you an education. Get you a good job with benefit. Ashley Jones showed up. Ashley Jones showed up for for watch night service, and she, in her testimony, she said, "You know how she talked, right?" She said, she said, Ashley Jones said, she said, I got a job. I got a real job. And I got a job with benefits. And the whole church lit up because now she has a job with benefits. Hallelujah to the land. You need a job with benefits. Claim your victories. Do well with what you, God has given you. Only God will give you unusual victories. God has given us unusual victory. If you are saved, if you are born again, that's an unusual victory. And let me tell you how he gave it to you. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died for you. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a skull hill called Calvary. 
Over 2,000 years ago, he made a plan for your life. They killed him. They took him off the cross. And he rose from the dead. It was victorious. It was unusual. He's God's only begotten son. He died for you that you can be unusual and have unusual victories. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus just like you are. Battered. Torn. Wounded and sad. Disgusted. Busted. Confused. Come to Jesus. The door is open. The invitation is extended. This is your moment. Come to Jesus. Just as you are, just as you are. The door is open. The door is open. The door is open. Surrender to him. The door is open. Yeah, Lord. Yeah, Lord. Submit it all to him. Blessed Savior he is. Come to Jesus. Surrender unto him. The door is open. Surrender. Give it all to Jesus. Give it all to him. Give it all to Jesus. Surrender it unto him. I surrender. Everything, everything, everything. Let it go. Everything to Jesus. All to Jesus. Bless his sake. Yeah, I surrender. If you've never received Jesus as your personal Savior, this is your moment. You've tried everything else. You need to try Jesus. If you would, bow your head with me wherever you are and invite Jesus into your life. Just repeat these simple words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe if you prayed this prayer, honestly trusting Jesus as your Savior, that you're now born again. When you die, you're on your way to heaven. We believe that you have a new place to reside, and that place is called heaven. If you're looking for a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church, where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction, where he is the captain of the ship, where he is leading, guiding, and directing us. Please let us know if you want to join with the New Beginning Church. We thank God for who he is and what he has already done. We serve the awesome and the amazing God.